Thank you, Federico. Um, so yeah, so two. Okay, so um, let's uh, start with um, like a brief introduction on uh, why maybe we, we want to use machine learning and in which context exactly. So the, um, typically with our um, computational experiments, we want to model materials and molecules so that we can discover and design new types for new, maybe new applications or improve already existing materials. So the typical workflow would be, let's say we have these um, nan nanotubes, carbon nanotubes, and we, this is a hypothetical structure. And uh, we want to first understand whether it's stable. So typically we would use, um, or we might want to use a quantum mechanical model to predict uh, its energy and maybe a few of its properties to see if it's relevant to the particular applications that we have in mind. And a very nice aspect, and that's where the acceleration comes from, is that this can be repeated over and over again on new compounds without, um, uh, with little efforts, let's say, hopefully, this compared to experiment to an experimental search. So the, um, the issue in this uh, picture is that quantum mechanical methods are accurate indeed, but also can be extremely costly and uh, in most, in many cases, real applications, they are actually out, they are not applicable because of their computational cost. So, in um, the last 12, 40, maybe even more, uh, even longer, uh, people have developed classical force fields as proxy to not necessarily quantum mechanical methods, but to be able to see to really simulate this uh, this system and maybe have an understanding. The problem of with these uh, typical techniques is that um, they often, it's also their strengths, uh, but they have a fixed functional form that is fairly simple, typically, that uh, is based on uh, uh, physical intuition and uh, also results, but also is not uh, complex enough to uh, really model the, the interactions within the material or the, the molecule. So that's where uh, machine learning methods come into the place because they, so in the last 20 years, they, pro they provide a very wide range of tools to be able to fit um, functions that, that, that can be extremely uh, uh, complex and they will still somehow, they, they, they in principle, can uh, represent them. So that's uh, that's really the, the big uh, advantage here. And also, they provide a very streamlined set of tools to um, interact with uh, the data set and uh, fitting the, the model's weight and uh, <clears throat> And, uh, yeah. So the so instead of directly predicting the property, the workflow with uh, machine learning methods become more like we build with our uh, favorite uh, quantum mechanical method. Uh, we build a reference data set that is used to train models that will then be used to actually predict the properties that we are interested in. So for this uh, tutorial, I will introduce you to uh, kernel methods. So kernel methods, it's, let's say, in a way, the simplest uh, kind of models that are nonlinear, that uh, uh, are very useful for, for regression. So the, um, if we want to model the energy of this uh, small ethanol molecule, the, really the textbook formula, the textbook expression for uh, its, uh, its model will be just a linear way, a, a linear combination of the um, of the, the weights of the model, the alpha n. These are the weights that are determined during the training, and then it's the kernel. So this kernel function, the takes two argument. It's the similarity between the input structure and the collection of the 
the, the collection of structure that were used in the in the data set. So really, we compute the similarity between the ethanol and with this um, other uh, molecule, and then with another molecule, etc. And we combine that with the weights of the model, and that will be our uh, predictions. So again, this is uh, already a nonlinear. This is a nonlinear model, even if it might look, um, let's say, uh, it might look linear in its uh, formu formulation. And the nonlinearity comes from really the kernel functions, and the fact that we use um, that we use the training points as a basis for the predictions. And also the very nice uh, feature of this, uh, of this kind of method is that it's very simple to, to fit. There is no um, ambiguity, let's say, because really we have a, a linear system of equations that we can directly, that we can solve either directly or in many ways. And there are also very few parameters, meaning there is one, this uh, lambda parameters, which is, let's say, can be interpreted as um, how, how much we want our model to fit to the data. So it can correspond to uh, an expected noise on our samples. And so if lambda is very small, then we will fit exactly to the data points, but maybe it will also produce a very rugged, uh, pre um, rugged uh, function. And so maybe we want it to be a bit more regular, a bit more smooth, like um, typical uh, interactions are, are actually very smooth. So that's, uh, let's say, kernel rich regression 101. And it's also, uh, maybe you have heard of quotient process regression. This is um, another type of method, but unless we talk about uh, predicting uh, um, the uncertainty associated with the prediction, then the two methods are really uh, functionally exactly the same. So, this uh, the functional form is not very practical because so if we go back to um, how uh, typical force fields are formulated we in many in most cases it's um, they, they can be seen as a sum of atom centered contribution and the, the main reason for that is really the fact that it's for linear scaling so the fact that we the energy associated with one configuration centered on let's say this carbon atom depends only on its uh, close surrounding um, is, is very important because uh, that allows us to both uh, maybe hope that uh, our model will be able to predict um, or train on a small on data set of small molecules or small. Uh, relatively small materials also, and that we can use it on much larger uh, configurations, types of configurations. And um, so that's the size extensivity. And um, also, yeah, the, the linear scaling is just that if we break down our problem uh, in such pieces, it does not scale, computing the energy does not scale anymore with the as a square of the number of atoms, but just uh, with a prefactor as a number of atom. And the added bonus also is that it's, uh, we have already a model that is uh, translationally invariant. So um, putting these two uh, components together, we can see that uh, like the, what has been typically done is to break down this to express this global similarity measure between two atomic configurations into a pairwise comparison between the local environments uh, within the, 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 target, like the, the target molecule or the target material with the data set. And so the, the big, uh, like the, the similar, the global similarity similarity measure is a, an average of a sum over local similarity measure. Also, maybe you have um, seen that there is a, this is a delta 
a b so th this is like a, this is just to make sure this uh, delta it's so a and b are the species associated with atom i and atom j respectively and so in this way we make sure that uh, we have a different model for different uh, central atomic species exactly in the same spirit as uh, what Nong just showed you previously. And so now we have uh, this component, so we can start see how uh, this can this model can be trained. So we go back to this uh, linear system of equation where the um, kernel matrix, so the elements of the kernel matrix are actually this uh, big, uh, but this global similarity measure with uh, the lambda, the regularization parameter. And in one way or another, we can solve this uh, linear system very easily for, um, the for some reference energies. Now it becomes a bit more tricky when we want to fit uh, also on the forces. Typically, so with uh, DFT code, we have both energy, but also forces that are uh, for free. So this is a, an additional information that we definitely want to use. Um, in this case, the direct uh, kernel um, essentially blows up because the kernel element associated with um, force, which uh, are depicted in this um, um, in this double sum here, uh, essentially uh, scales as the number of atoms in the system. And so the linear system becomes very hard to crack since we, we end up with matrices that uh, can be uh, 100,000, maybe a million by million uh, element, which is practically a bit uh, cumbersome and also it's definitely it's not necessary to go to such lengths, probably. So the the method that I'm going to highlight here is the, called the Gaussian approximation potential. It was intro first introduced by uh, uh, Albert Bartok and uh, co-workers. But it's also uh, one can also find it in um, a textbook for uh, a kernel method a Gaussian process. Uh, textbook uh, for machine learning. It's called, uh, so it's a low rank approximation of the kernel matrix. So this gigantic kernel matrix that uh, we just uh, saw before, we want to um, express it with not uh, the number, with not just with, with um, our training data set, we want to actually project this data set onto a smaller set. So this is what this what is called the sparse point. Just to give you um, an idea of what that could be, uh, there is like a, this plot. It's um, a function for which I, I created some uh, noisy uh, samples, and then I fitted the Gaussian process regression on these uh, on these samples, and also identified sparse points. So in this case, you can see that in one dimension we have probably many, too many points. Uh, oh, the, the points are really over uh, determining the, um, the, 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 pos the possible predictions that we want to make. And uh, that's where the sparse points are useful is that these are, they, again, they are the new basis point. And so instead of using the data, the data set as, um, as a basis, we use these sparse points. And, and we have still the information, all the information from the rest of the data set, which allows you to still fit very well the, uh, the, the target uh, function. And uh, so the, the, the nice, uh, the essential aspect of it is that uh, instead of having to invert a matrix that is uh, gigantic, it's only an M by N, M uh, matrix, so M being the number of sparse points which is typically much, much, much lower than the number of atoms in the, in the data set. And, and, so, and also now we can make predictions. So this is also an aspect that is quite uh, important, 
is that um, the whole procedure becomes quite uh, much more uh, easy because instead of uh, carrying around the training data set to, to make any prediction, now we only, only have to carry around the weights of the model and uh, the sparse points. Only this information is necessary to, to be able to make a new prediction and also to predict forces, of course. So I, so far, I've only discussed the, how to handle the kernel computation. So now um, let me briefly um, introduce you the, uh, what we call a representation. So one way to look at it, might, maybe, is that the, this similarity measure between local environment this kernel, uh, so this kernel between, between these two local environments uh, can actually be seen as an inner product between a feature map that transforms the local environment into a set of features that encode hopefully um, all the information necessary to, to make a, a good prediction. So this feature map, uh, that's what we typically call a representation. It's, it's the like the step to go from an, the Cartesian coordinates to the uh, to to the uh, to, to to the machine learning model, let's say, to actual features, uh, and these rep these representation they have to really to encode quite a few uh, uh, physical uh, um, physical properties. Of uh, our target property of our target. So in, in our case, it's energy. So the energy as a property is invariant with respect to the permutation of uh, uh, identical atoms, also to rigid translations of the system, rigid rotations. So these are, are the three things. Then also we want to, since we model um, a smooth function, the energy. Uh, we want also our representation to be smooth with respect to the movement of atoms. And uh, the, the last, but also quite an important aspect is the completeness. So we want uh, our representation not to map two different com configuration into the same configuration. So that, uh, so, so this, uh, this kind of criteria our complex set of criteria has led to uh, the emergence of uh, many representations, uh, among which you will probably uh, hear during this week. So atomic cluster expansion, smooth overlap of atomic position, uh, moment tensor of uh, potential, um, atomic uh, permutationally, permutationally invariant uh, polynomials, uh, bell parallel symmetric functions. But uh, for this uh, tutorial, I will um, focus more on the SOAP representation, which um, hopefully will, so this, uh, the, hopefully this introduction will also give you an idea of um, how this other representation might, uh, might look like, or how to understand a bit better what they do um, with the Cartesian coordinates and the identities of the atom. So in the case of the soap representation, we start from the atomic structure, of course, and represent it as a, an atomic density. So here, what's, what you need to keep in mind is that different colors meet, mean different sets of um, densities. So you have the densities for the hydrogens, for the carbon, for the oxygens. Um, and then we symmetrize these the densities over the translational group, which effectively just corresponds to set the reference, so to decompose our representation into atom-centered densities. So we end up with a collection of densities that are centered on every atom. And then we symmetrize over the rotation, uh, over the rotation group. So that corresponds to, you know, in, for, again, for this tutorial, we, it's the SOAP representation, but more specifically, the power spectrum, which corresponds to um, three-body correlation 
information within the, the environment. So these are really the, the features that are encoded in, the, in this representation. And one can obtain it by taking a tensor product between two uh, different uh, densities and averaging overall possible rotation. And to do this um, fairly abstract and also complex uh, procedure, the best way is to expand uh, these, um, these atomic densities, and atom center densities on a basis. So here are the expansion coefficients, and here is the expansion basis, so a radial uh, basis, a set of radial basis function and spherical harmonics. And the power spectrum has a very simple uh, form, form, which is this uh, uh, outer product of two densities and a contraction on on one dimension. Um, also, yeah, of course, it, you can also refer to the article for more information. So to wrap up the, the tutorial, so to wrap up what we are going to see in the, um, uh, on the notebook uh, corresponds to really this process. So we start with a training data set that we are going to featureize using the SOAP uh, power spectrum representation uh, for on one, on one hand to select the sparse points. How to select them is actually uh, any, quite an interesting uh, topic. Uh, and then we will compute for the whole data set, the features, the gradients with respect to the features and uh, compute the kernel in following the gap framework. So with using the sparse points, build this uh, KNM uh, so-called KNM matrix, and then solve this linear system of equation to determine the weights of the model. And um, also, yes, keep in mind that um, the exact kernel functions that we are going to use, it's the um, corresponds to the inner product between two sub vectors that are normalized and uh, raised to a certain power zeta. And um, yeah, and then we will uh, make some predictions following exactly the, the same pipeline. But in this case, since we have the uh, already the weights, yeah, the let's say the, uh, the exact uh, contractions that are done here are uh, maybe done in slightly different orders. And to do this uh, two task, we will be using uh, Librascal, which is a library that uh, I uh, used to develop uh, for quite, a, quite some time with uh, my colleagues, Max, <laughs> thank you. And um, that, so you can find this, uh, the, uh, the documentation for this uh, library uh, following this link. This is, uh, it is uh, implemented in C14. And uh, what we are going to play around with is the high level Python interface. And this library provides uh, an efficient uh, uh, implementation of the SOAP representation and of the GAP framework. So we will be able to train and also make some predictions with it. Okay, so uh, maybe we can, uh, let's, sh should we move to the, um, directly to, to the notebooks or? Uh, yes, and let's uh, keep the, the question and answer period uh, at the end of the, the end. of the notebook, yes. Yeah, so Felix, just to remind you, uh, I mean, we would like to have around 20 minutes for Q&A, so just for you to. Note. Yes. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Yeah. So the okay. So the the notebook is uh, fairly simple and okay. Yeah. I went a bit over time, so I will just uh, briefly tell you about it while uh, it's running. So Felix, I'm not sure if Felix, you can. We are not. Yes. Yeah. I think if you can change your tab, that would be even better. Uh, yes. All right. If, even though people who are on Deep Note should be able to see it. But still, I think. Okay. Nice. Do you see it now? Yes. Perfect. Um, 
please uh, join the channels, uh, the Slack channels that are written on, on the chat of the Zoom. Yeah, yeah. So this, um, so this notebook is about reproducing um, a, poten a silicon uh, potential using the data set provided on, by this, uh, in this article. Um, this is very, a very nice article, actually, that uh, you probably would like to read to understand a bit more on uh, the CAP framework and its applications. And so we first uh, start with by downloading this uh, data set. So it really has the XYZ coordinates for many um, silicon uh, structures with forces and energies computed at the same level of DFT theory. And uh, we will uh, start by, and so we, we want to model uh, again this uh, function. So we, start, we load uh, structures. In this particular case, uh, I'm going, I'm excluding most of the different faces because uh, to do it live is, uh, is a bit taxing uh, for the virtual machines. Uh, here is, uh, okay, we, that's an important uh, aspect, typically to understand roughly whether uh, we are uh, doing something wrong. We split the data set into two sets. We train on one and then predict on the other to see whether it's, uh, uh, it's doing uh, weird things. Then we have mainly four, high, four parameters to um, define the uh, soap representation, the cutoff, the weeds of the Gaussian that we use to represent the density, to smear the, the positions, and uh, the number of radial and angular basis functions that we have. So let's just, yeah, the interaction cutoff, how I chose five, here the numbers are really rough. I did not optimize them at all. Uh, so I chose, you chose five because if you look at the RDF of this, uh, for this data set, Basically, five function is enough to, to see uh, three uh, shells, neighboring shells. And then the number of radial basis functions. So here are the actual basis functions that are going to be used in, to uh, build uh, the SOAP representation. And, and so you, you can see that uh, they really, um, the, for five angstrom, it's probably enough to have seven of them to already have a good spatial, re spatial resolution on the radial direction. So then we want to find the sparse points. So to do that, we are going to use the farthest point sampling algorithm. So in the case, so if we have, uh, let's say uh, this double well uh, uh, distribution of points, what the farthest point sampling algorithm will find, will, will identify as good at, as points, are these uh, orange dots. So it's really, we, we take uniformly distributed, uh, as uniformly distributed as possible from the, from the data set. And so we select them. Um, Yes, we also, we, in this notebook, we do uh, feature specification that uh, probably uh, Rose will uh, discuss in more details tomorrow. Uh, then we want to train, of course, uh, the, um, the model. So we first compute this um, kernel matrix. Okay, perfect, that's done. Then uh, we can split it so that we can get a rough estimate. And just one thing to note is, solving directly this uh, linear system of equation is often not a very good idea because it's not very numerically stable. So uh, in this case, what we are doing is solving this uh, alternative but equivalent um, system of equation. And then we can save uh, the weights that we have uh, determined with uh, the rest of, the, of what constitute the model. Okay, so now with this uh, model, we can make some, make some test. Okay, 
never mind. So this is the typical uh, test that uh, one will do, would do. Uh, it's uh, a plot of the predicted versus references and um, it's often really not very informative. Uh, in this case, what typically one would like to look at are really the RMSC error uh, and maybe also the um, R square score or the Pearson's correlation. So th these two are very good um, indicator of whether you are fitting something or not. And then when, uh, when it's working, then it's not, they're not very informative anymore. Then probably also to compare uh, different models. So uh, a few parameters, one can get a, an intuition of what they might have to look like in terms of numbers. But for some others, it's much more difficult. So for example, how many sparse points do we want to choose? Um, how many, how much do we, do we want to sparsify the representation? And this is typically uh, a good way to, uh, to compare different models is to use a k-fold cross-validation, which is a highlight. Um, yeah, the, the, the idea is given here by this small GIF. It's a very simple procedure. Uh, but that I don't have the time to do here. Uh, and now we can uh, predict on uh, some, so compare with some more meaningful uh, targets. In this case, uh, the elastic constant of uh, diamond, the diamond phase and the beta tin phase of silicon. And, mm -hmm. and so as you can see, this particular model, I just trained it on uh, the diamond phase. So we get decent um, estimates for the bulk modulus or, uh, and other um, parameter. Also the lattice constant is quite good for the diamond phase, but it's not even converging to the, for the beta tin uh, case. So what I'm going to do is to load a beta a, a model trained on the full data set. Just to make this prediction, to see that uh, we have a model that uh, kind of hugely concerned. Mm. Um, right, and so, and then we can, uh, yeah. Have a, have a look to see, also compare on other, uh, other observable like this uh, energy versus volume uh, curve for the different phases and see that we, our model reproduces them quite well. Uh, at least reproduces the DFT reference quite well. That's one thing. Uh, maybe the last, before we go to the question, the last thing I wanted to, uh, to mention is that, so this is a dimer curve. So the, the data that is used to predict, so that there is no magic in with this uh, machine learning potential. So it really, the, the main focus should always be on the data that one uses. Uh, so in the case where one uses only the diamond phase to train a model, you, what you can see is a mod, uh, so this is the, the dimer curve for two silicon atoms that we pull apart. And that's the energy, the predicted energy by the model. And in this case, it's uh, definitely not very physical. And the main re and the reason for that is that the, the, all of the, our reference uh, for the diamond phase basically correspond to this particular well. So we don't have any data either on the left or on the right. Which, which is why we end up with this curve. While if we train on the full data set, we get a much more um, reasonable uh, looking dimer, dimer curve. And uh, yeah, maybe also that's something that uh, you might want to, to play around with is that uh, one can use uh, uh, 
uh, ASC to run um, some molecular dynamic simulation to also investigate a bit further whether the, uh, your model is doing a good job. Is suppose if I can model properly what you want. Okay, so maybe let's move on to the questions. Are there? So we have a first. Cool. Let's see. We have a question from Victor. You can unmute yourself and speak. All right. Yes. Thank you very much for the presentation. Very interesting. Uh, I was wondering, since you take these great care to uh, sparsify your data and make these matrices smaller, um, can you give an indication of like upper limits of the amount of data you can process with this kernel method? Mm. So thank you for your question. So this is really hardware uh, related. So of course you want, if you want to solve the direct problem, you are limited by memory basically. So um, you, for example, uh, in my former lab in Michele Sciaiotti, we have a node that has uh, one terabyte of RAM. And that gives you already a, a lot of room to, to train very large models already, much larger than uh, probably what you, what you would need. It's clear, thank you. So at least with these techniques, I would, I think uh, uh, it's, we are not really limited anymore. Okay, thanks. Now we have a question from Connor, Connor Allen. Hi, uh, yeah, uh, just to also follow on from that question when doing a sparse decomposition, how significant is the choice of algorithm that you use to choose your sparse points? Um, so I see that you, you say that in this tutorial for the, because it's a smaller data set, you get away with using this farthest, um, was, I can't remember what the yeah, algorithm was, yeah, yeah. but um, for larger data sets, um, when I guess when you're not worried about the, con you know, um, uh, in that instance, is there any rule of thumb um, that you can use to make a choice on what that algorithm should be? It, um, I would I would say actually the fastest point sampling has been quite uh, fine in um, in my experience it's actually it's already quite good it's very simple as an idea but it's it's quite good because it really targets what you want uh, there is also another one uh, that comes to my mind it's called CUR algorithm it's based on matrix decomposition to identify uh, points. And um, I then another, so in, in principle, one does not have to choose a sparse point from the training set because these are completely, they don't have to be physical. It's just for convenience, we use them, we use physical reference for that. But one could also imagine optimizing these as parameter of the model that corresponds to variational uh, Gaussian process regulation. Okay, thank you. Now there's a question um, from Ganesh. So you can unmute yourself and speak. Uh, yeah, I just had a again repeated question from this data sets. Uh, uh, how many uh, minimum data sets uh, I can use? Uh, like, what is the possible of minimum data sets I can use to fit a good potentials for my system? So, I think your question is depends a lot on what you mean by good. So, uh, as um, uh, as I highlighted, highlighted this, I try to highlight in this tutorial is that you can already, if you have, let's say, reference just for the diamond phase of silicon, mm -hmm. for which are also very good uh, force fields, actually, um, then you can, uh, if, you, if, you're, if you just want to have this phase right, you might mm -hmm. also just use references from that. And uh, you, you can see it's 
uh, I we already have a, a decent. Uh, uh, so how many training points? A, a very decent potential on a, using uh, four hundred references, four hundred mm -hmm. data points. And so okay, the, the uh -huh. question is like if you want it to be also good for most of like the all the phases of um, of silicon and then also for different uh, okay so amorphous and liquid and maybe some surfaces uh, then you you need to increase your data set and in this particular um, case the, the the whole data set is about 2500 configurations okay so uh, just to add to that, uh, so we have a full day on configurational sampling where there will be a focus on how to select the training set and how to actually minimize these things. So, so yeah, so these, these questions I think will be answered in greater detail in those talks. But of course you can feel free to try these tutorials and just mess around and see, you know, what's the smallest number of data, uh, of smallest amount of data that you can use. Okay, thank you. Now we have Akram Ibrahim. Uh, yes, um, um, so um, thank you for the presentation. Um, and um, I have a question about um, um, the descriptor uh, that you showed in the beginning for uh, kernel methods. So mm -hmm. uh, b basically what, what I see um, is th this descriptor it depends only on like the species and atomic positions, the subdescriptor, right? So yes. um, yeah, it was like the neural network potential, but like of, of a different kind. Uh, so uh, uh, I don't know like if there is um, any um, descriptors for like kernel based methods nowadays that uh, like take care of like uh, charged systems or uh, magnetic systems. Is it like still under progress or um, it, if you can give an idea about this. So mm -hmm. I, I know like there, there is like um, some development on um, uh, like um, descriptors for uh, neural networks for charged systems now. So um, in terms of um, like the kernel based methods, is, is there something like this for charged systems or magnetic systems or uh, is it still- so For, for yeah. charged system, definitely, yes. So um, Max has a, a beautiful paper on this uh, exact same topic. Um, for the magnetization though, uh, I, it's like, it's always with, within a particular approximation and, uh, yeah, maybe Max. Mm. Um, um, well, not charge system exactly. Um, so with charge separation, yes, but of course, if you put a, a charge in a periodic box, then it's going to, the energy is going to blow up to infinity, right? So, um, we do have systems with significant charge separation. If you're looking for like the interaction of two charge molecules, I'd suggest, uh, for instance, that you check out this paper on um, multi-scale long-range descriptions. And I think Jigyasso is on the author list for that, as well as Andrea Grasafi. I can I can send a link in the uh, yes, Zoom please. or Slack, whichever mm -hmm. works best for you. Yeah, Slack, please. Slack on Slack. All right. I will send Thank a link you. both to the paper where we do the molecular dipoles uh, actually, where we did capture some some charge separation within the molecule as well, and then also the um, the long range thing. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for, sorry, Felix, do you mind if I quick say something about magnetization as well? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, because it's um, so it's the same thing with dipoles, right? It's just that you have like a magnetic dipole on each atom, right? So you need to have a separate machine learning model that also assigns these dipolar quantities, right? And the idea behind these dipolar quantities is that they transform as tensors when you rotate the system. And I think Jigyasa is going to be telling us um, a lot maybe more about Ivan, that. So that's... Maybe Ivan as well, I don't know. Ah, uh, yeah, quite possibly. Um, we'll see, because it's becoming, you know, really much, very much a hot topic these days in uh, machine learning. So um, yeah, Thank there's, there's um, about five neural networks that do this now. But anyway, that's all I wanted to say. Thanks. So we have a last question by Ahar Sid. Hey, uh, great presentation. Um, so you've used uh, SOAP for, uh, to generate your descriptors, right? 
which are atom centered and so i was wondering if you uh, also accounted for uh, weights or weighting for example um, because i've heard that you know adding extra weights sort of uh, um, removes the far away effects of like uh, of interactions that that is like you don't want uh, interactions of one particular atom to uh, with with something that's very far away and i've heard weighting apparently helps that so have you tested uh, weighting for soap i not sure i follow your question sorry um are you saying that done weighting in uh, con- done weighting the representation for uh, let's say contributions that are far away uh, <clears throat> yeah so like um, it's like weighting the atomic uh, weighting the atomic density and uh, that apparently reduces the contributions from uh, you know atoms that are very far away and so have you i just i wanted to ask if you have tried uh, weighted soaps is this uh, like radial yes. scaling or is it something yes, else yes yes yeah that, that's exactly what i understand that. as well max yeah <laughs> yeah. Sorry. yeah yeah so uh, yes i have uh, um, an article about exactly this and uh, as you as you said it's uh, really about just down weighting contributions for for atoms that are far and uh, like trying out on different uh, types of properties that i would say this kind of cons- consideration of really need to be put into perspective with respect to the uh, the target property so for the energy it makes a lot of sense and that's uh, what we yeah so so the really the representation encodes the fact that if you have an atom that moves far away from the center the change in energy should be small and this is encoded by the fact that you don't see it that you don't weight it yeah thank you so much mm-hmm. okay. okay there is a, a question in the in the chat by kanesh sivaraman and uh, he says, uh, does Librascal have, have a LAMP support and CUDA open MP, MPI parallelization? I mean, CUDA mm. or open MP or MPI parallelization? It's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> it, um, I think it's still a, a work in progress for uh, the LAMPs integration. But uh, uh, yeah, the, the LAMPS uh, plugin should arrive uh, relatively shortly, uh, I think. And then uh, it has uh, uh, open, M- it, would, it will have uh, open MP and MPI parallelization just through the LAMPS uh, um, interface, let's say. No CUDA kernels though. Thanks. Okay, so, um... It's four o'clock London time, and I think that we can meet again at four twenty to start with the, the the following talk, by which will be given by Ivan Novikov. But we have until well, ten, don't we have ten more minutes technically for questions? And then we have a twenty-minute break, so that means we start at. I can't read it. I can't read my own schedule. Oh. I mean, there were no more. Uh... Yeah, so formally we have 10 more minutes for questions. Ah. Yeah, so yeah because if, the if next... there are any, or if somebody wants to discuss something, please feel feel free for that. Yeah. So if I understand the schedule correctly, or Elena, correct me if I'm wrong, but the next talk starts at 4.30, right? Oh. Uh... Uh, that's how I but, interpret it anyway. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so in any case, we have a break now. Maybe this would be a good time to, you know, ask the questions that you didn't get to ask earlier, or you know, just let, have the speakers stay on for some interactive Q and A. Um, yep. And we will meet together for the next talk at four thirty.